All right, welcome everybody. It is October 5th and this is the Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Everyone is aware of the two things that we must abide by, the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen and the code of conduct that is linked in our agenda. So for announcements today, we have the standard Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. If you do have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, please do uh, leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Uh, the second announcement is uh, a workshop that is scheduled for October 12th called How to Create a Currency Management Application and Deploy it on a Fa Hyperledger Fabric Network. Um, so if you are interested in attending that, please do register for uh, that workshop on the link in the agenda. Any other announcements that anybody has or would like to make today? No, okay. So for quarterly reports, we do have the BASU report that is out there. Um, I think we're, we're starting to get um, a number of people have reviewed that. But uh, are there any questions or comments on the BASU report? No, okay. Uh, for the Caliper report, I did uh, put a message on the issue that we create uh, when we um, let people know that the reports are due for Caliper. And I haven't heard anything back or seen anything back on that particular issue. Arun? Thanks, Tracy. Um, I know there is an active email thread going on, which David has started with Performance Working Group. Just curious um, if he has heard of anything from Caliper current maintainers. That was for David, right? Right. David Boswell, have you, David Boswell, have you heard anything uh, from the Caliper maintainers uh, in your ongoing emails with the Performance and Security Working Group and the Caliper maintainers? I did actually ping them yesterday and haven't heard back from that yet, but a couple months ago we had had some back and forth and there was interest in doing some stuff early next year. It sounds like people were going to be busy for the rest of the year, this year, but they were saying they wanted to... Uh, um, there was talk of doing a meetup, or excuse me, a workshop early next year. So I had recently heard from them, but not not within the last month or two. Gotcha, thank you. All right, so we will continue to try and reach out to Caliper on different channels. Um, Arun, I don't know if there's a, a particular channel that uh, you think would work well, but maybe you could reach out and see if you can get in touch with the, the existing caliper maintainers. Yeah, Tracy. All right, for upcoming reports next week, we have the cacti and the fabric reports that are due. Uh, so we'll look to, to see those coming in next week. All right, so then for our discussion items today, we have two discussion items. The first one is to take a look at the POC election schedule. Uh, it is a requirement that the POC approve um, these timelines as they uh, come in. And so uh, this is the, the first topic that we have. And then the second topic that we have will be a task force discussion. So um, with that, um, this timeline should look fairly familiar for folks on this call. Obviously, you all ran last year and uh, went through this process. So. I think the dates are just updated to reflect obviously the new year, as well as some learnings that we had last year around um, timing and the amount of time that's necessary. So I think the first change is instead of giving an entire month uh, for the uh, TOC nominees to nominate themselves, uh, we're just giving two weeks. Um, it seemed like what ended up happening last year is that people waited until the end of the month before they filed. and so. We had talked about last year just uh, shrinking this, and so we did do that uh, for the, the dates. So we will be starting the timeline October 16th, and 
uh, running that through the end of October. And then uh, for the next section, uh, we have the election process that will run from no November 1st through November 14th. Uh, so we'll again use the Helios voting to do that uh, particular process. And um, the last thing that we have is the appointment process uh, by the governing board. So if you recall, uh, we have uh, six people who are elected by uh, the maintainers of the different hyperledger projects. And then we have the remaining five uh, that are elected by the governing board. And so their timeline is November 15th through December 4th. Uh, I think we gave them slightly longer just because of the holidays that fall in there in the United States. And then, um, yeah, the last thing is after we get the 11 TOC members, we'll vote for chair and vice chair. And that runs from December 4th through December 15th. Anything else, Rai, that you would like to add to that since you were the one who put this together? No comment. Okay. Any questions from the TOC members? No. Okay. Um, so, Rai, do we need to vote for this? Is that uh, is that the right steps, though? Sure. I think why we not? do, right? Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, I think we do have to approve it. So. Um, if someone would like, I shall so. oppose the motion. All right, thanks, Peter. Second. And I think that was Dave, was it? I think so. I went off mute to do it, but somebody beat me. No, I oh, said, okay. this, that was Sean saying, can we get a second? Uh, oh, by second. Okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, on the matter for the TOC, which is the election timeline, Stephen Kern, how do you vote? Approved. Okay. Peter? Yes. Marcus? Approved. David Inert? Yes. Bobby? Approved. Yes. Rama? Approved. Tracy? Yes, I approve. And I think, uh, Ryan, you were breaking up, but I think you did say, oh, no, yes. Yes. I uh, didn't hear, so yes. Okay. Uh, the matter before the TOC is approved with uh, two absences. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks, everybody. So we will uh, start the process then in just under two weeks. Um, a week and a half, I think it is. Great. And then the second item on our agenda is the task force proposal for security artifacts signing. Uh, so I think Arun, we will hand this off to you. Arun, would you like to drive? Arun, you're on mute. Um, can you guys, can hear you hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Tracy. So, um, this is, hey everyone, um, this is the second time we are meeting on this topic about um, security artifact signing. Uh, artifact signing. Now, um, I know in the previous discussion, we went through understanding some principles behind which um, the six-door implementation is done. And we also saw a sample response of what gets produced and some of the issues that we need to focus on. And um, in today's discussion, it would be nice if we can expand into those items and see 
if you have any ideas on that. Uh, but before getting started, maybe we can have a refresher of what we discussed last time. That way it's been a while. We'll quickly refresh and then get started on that topic. Uh, if I may share the screen. You've got it, Arun. Go right ahead. Thanks, Sean. Um, right. So a uh, quick refresher or the summary of what we discussed in the previous call is that why do we why do we need signing for artifacts and then what kind of artifacts can be signed through six store and um, the different components that six store itself has uh, for instance there is this component called full show which allows us which kind of acts as a ca uh, for us to issue a short lived certificate now there were discussions on why do we need short lived certificate the reason being um, we want to generate a signing key which we don't want to maintain for a longer period. However, we want to establish credibility to that signing key. Uh, the one way to do that is, for instance, if, since we are all familiar with the blockchain technology, we, one of the way we could have done that is generate a short lived key and the public key information required for proving the signature can, could have been put on blockchain, right? And this is a very similar concept. There is like certificate generated, which has a specific validity and that validity information is captured. And there's this component called cosine. Um, this component is a CLI component. It allows us to include these uh, commands needed for signature verification or maybe producing the signature itself in our GitHub Action CI pipelines. The other component is record. Um, like, um, it's it's let's say this is like equivalent of a, any blockchain ledger, but it's not re, uh, really a blockchain. It's a publicly visible um, transaction log or auditable information, which is again there were debates on who may, who's currently maintaining this on the public instance. I believe uh, we all discussed at least in the initial phase. It's okay for us to now uh, go with what we have um, available through a public installation. Now the, the uh, other component that we discussed is about policy controller. This is in with respect to those people who want to verify the, the authenticity of this binaries that we are producing artifacts that we have produced. And um, this particular component is, is available for Kubernetes, but for those who are Non Kubernetes or who would like to verify, they can always utilize cosine to verify the signature on the artifacts. And we also briefly discussed about advantages. And then, uh, in terms of authentication, we discussed that there is OIDC support, which allows us to have organization wide, for instance, at Hyperledger Foundation, there can be an administrator or um, the community architects maintaining an identity that can be shared across to different repositories, whichever is producing artifact, which can eventually be used in the signing uh, processes. The um, other things or challenges that we discussed were in terms of, um, so, so some of these um, um, aspects that we discussed is about when a signature is produced, where is it kept and what's the responsibility of maintainers and what information do we need to store and how is that final artifact uh, getting stored. And let, let, let's say, for instance, we generate, um, at, at least what I tested from my personal experience is on the container image production. And when we signed that, it it used to, uh, it, it worked well in the sense, like we did not have to explicitly remember anything or store additional information related to this uh, process. But when I tested that for a blob file, like which eventually would be some binary that we produce, in those cases, um, we generated artifact had to be stored somewhere for me to go ahead and verify it later. So that's one one open question. And um, personally, I don't know answer for it. If we need any special tooling or things to be taken care in order to use that for blobs. But if you have any information that will help. 
so that's the gist of what we discussed and yeah any um, thoughts from anybody before we dig deep into some of these aspects Uh, Arun, um, what is, can you tell me why, it, <clears throat> what it means by short-lived certificate? What's the implication of that? What's short-lived mean? Right. So, um, and, and Hart or others, feel, and, and, or I know you're involved, feel free to pitch in. So my understanding of short-lived certificate and the reasoning behind that is, let's say we've would like to sign our artifact. The challenges that we face is in terms of where do we store our signing key and what if that signing key is compromised? And let's say, what if it gets refreshed with the new signing key? How do we keep the trail log of uh, or record of saying that here is the previous key since this artifact was produced maybe in 2022, use this public key for verification. In, in here, the idea is we generate a signing key and then the public key associated with that is put inside a certificate which is generated by full show. Um, and the reason for making it short-lived is so that we don't need to store the key anywhere. Uh, it can live in runtime memory when we run the CI pipelines or the jobs. The certificate itself is stored in record so that the tool, uh, the cosine or the uh, policy controller would pull in this information from record and um, it would understand which certificate to pull in order to verify the signature. So, so uh, that's my understanding. That's the reasoning behind why it is short lived. And it is all, it's also to safeguard that way we, um, we don't in, end up having a key which has longer validity than what we require for signing process. So it, it is, it's a one-time use key, essentially. You, you generate a certificate, you hand the certificate, and you use it once to sign thing, and then it's done. Okay, I guess. Kind of, yes. Um, I, I believe like there is option for us to control how long the key can, can be valid, like how long the certificate can be valid. Okay. Uh, default time being probably 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of <clears throat> steps there that I don't understand how they would work, but hopefully <laughs> well, I'll learn more as you go. Well, like what? I mean... <laughs> I think, well, yeah. uh, like, okay, so I've signed a binary. I, I now I get a binary. I want to authenticate it. Um, somehow I have to resolve it. So, I mean, it's all the same things I think of when I go to identity and, and those. I've got to resolve some identifier associated with the binary to find the key associated with it. Then I have to valid, I have to get the public key um to verify that the signature matches i got to know where the signature is and then i've got to figure out why that signature is bound to the the issuer of the binary what's the binding and how do i figure that out and i i, I don't i don't see how all those pieces fit together in this i'm i'm assuming they do um i just don't see how they do yeah i mean you 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 have to you have to provide the credentials along with the artifacts so that people can check that okay. this is actually working. And so the, the, the the only thing really is this ephemeral keys that you use to sign that frees you from having to store the private key forever. Uh, here instead, they replace this by putting this transparency log against which you can check that the this was signed and by the identity you know that is given to you and um, 
they had the control, whoever, you know, did that, had the control of that identity at that time. Yeah. And they don't need the key to show that because it's the log. And the log, as Arun alluded to, it's really a ledger. The the thing is yeah. it's not decentralized. That's why it's not a blockchain, right? Right. But it uses, you know, the same kind of mechanism internally to 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 make it temper resistant. I know Hart has raised his hand. Um, so Stephen adding on to the explanation, right? So in my personal experience or experiment that I did, I was able to get that required information for verification with GHCR. Like I did not need um, anything other than an identity that I used for signing. And most of the other information, it was able to pull in and fetch it. And um, okay. uh, But for the blob, that's where... I had to explicitly remember and store that information, or at least remember what information to pull in from record. So um, record had all the information needed for verification. I just needed to point to that record in record. Um, Hart? Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say, Stephen, you're exactly right. This is basically a, an identity system uh, built on a ledger. Um, and so you can go to town uh, criticizing it as much as you want, because it is not as advanced as, say, an identity system on a ledger that you are building. Um, <laughs> but it is sort of what we have right now. Uh, and I will say, like, if, uh, if you have uh, <laughs> points on the architecture, uh, feel free to, uh, to join the uh, six door group. Um, yeah, it's not it's not necessarily that I'm criticizing it or that I just don't see uh, how the points all stick together. It's because it's, I and it's probably because you, that is my background is yeah. is yeah. Your, uh, your your complaints are totally valid. Uh, you're in Arno's tube. I mean, they just haven't had the engineering work uh, put into this and sort of, you know, people are happy with um, for now with, you know, sort of a centralized ledger uh, for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the short, the, as Arno and Arund explained, uh, the short lived certificates are very desirable. Um, and I think they did a good job of explaining that. Yeah. Uh, but yes, if you want to, uh, if you want to build the next, um, implementation of six door you should get in touch with them <laughs> no but i you know i think it's worth playing around a little bit cosine it's very easy and and you'll okay. get a better feeling of what it's like i mean the fact is you can sign anything you want you can they have this thing called signing a blob which can be anything but you know because then the the question becomes okay how do you find that credential information to check right Exactly. And I'm thinking, I'm going through the, and thinking, you hash it, and now you've got an identifier. Steven so, said to use a did resolver. <laughs> exactly. No, gonna, but they, gonna... so, <laughs> <laughs> no, but so, so depending on the type of artifacts, you know, the method varies. So if you have an image, uh, a container image, right? Right. You can associate metadata against the, the along with the, the image with the registry, they use that. Yeah. And so, like I said, if it's just a blob of data that you put on some, like a GitHub release, you know, uh, feature, the uh, then it's it's just another attachment next to the binary you release. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's part of what I was thinking of was for each of these things, there's got to be some method of the verifier knowing how to how to find the signature. And then how to find the key associated with it, and and it can be beside it, um, it could be in it. So those are the different things I'm thinking of. It could be that you you take a binary, um, if you if you're finding a binary somewhere in the internet, you could hash it and therefore find an, a unique identifier for it. So there's a you know there's a variety of ways. I, I was trying to figure out, for example, does each um, type of artifact have a standard way of saying here's where the uh here's where the verifier would find the uh, you know the the signature for this the yeah 
the signature, I guess. And then here's how they would take that signature, trace it back to the um, the public key that signed it, and and therefore and there and then back to the right. um, identity that that did it. So the the way the identity tracing back is it's done through a CA, and um, but it's just that link between the artifact itself, its key, and then and then the key that and then the public key that uh, is used to verify it. Yeah, and, and the other thing is when you use cosign to sign, it actually prompts you, like if the default is to use GitHub ID, and um, it will actually connect to, because it uses open ID connect, right? So if you make the experiment, it's, it's kind of interesting. You, you'll see your browser will prompt you for your login if you're not logged in already. So they do check at that time, that you're in control of that identity. And that's what uh, that's the identity that's attached to the signature that's in the certificate attached to the artifacts. And like I said, depending on the type of artifacts, you know, the 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 method to find the the the, the credential varies. For containers, it is standard because it depends on the uh, uh, the uh, the registry, and so they have defined a way to do that, and everybody uses it the same way. If it's just a blob, well, then it depends on you. <laughs> the you. URL I'm looking for is sigstore slash cosine. That's GitHub uh, in GitHub. Sigstore cosine. Yeah, you can go to sigstore.dev. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks so much, Stephen. So I think that's one of the bigger questions that we will need to find answer to. Um I like the idea of utilizing GitHub releases and attaching additional files for verification purpose. And maybe in the notes or maybe documentation, we can say, here's how somebody can go and verify. And these are the verification information that are attached alongside the release. This may work still for the artifacts that we produce in, uh, within the GitHub releases, but I'm not sure, let's say, uh, for instance, if Fabric um, releases a Java SDK, and that gets stored in Maven repository. How do we produce a verification information for that? Uh, so having said that, like Sigstore does have a plugin for Maven for verification purposes. Haven't experimented it, but. I'm not sure if I'm audible. Now you are. Okay. Um. So yeah. The the other thought process I had in order to overcome this was, um, at an organization wide, since we also discussed that, uh, community architects in a way would maintain an, an identity required for all the pipelines. And since we also have standardized um, like how the pipelines are run, mostly using GitHub Actions, we could have an organization-wide policy for somebody to verify artifacts. Any thoughts from others? Or, or um, 
or any project who currently follow any other process for signing artifacts? Any thoughts from you? I'm not sure how to take the silence as, so I'll assume, yeah. I'm in agreement with you, and I, you know, this is, I don't think any projects are doing any artifact signing at this point. Um, this is something we need to be doing. You know, um, as Stephen points out, you know, this is, you know, not the most, it's not the most optimized solution, um, but, you know, hopefully it is easy. Um, and it's it's what we're looking for here is painless and simple for projects to set up. Gracie. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think everybody's probably in agreement. I think the question is, how do we get there? Um, you know, what is the what are the steps that need to be taken? Is this something that um, you know you're asking the community architects? do is this something that you're um you're planning to put together a sample github action for people I, I guess i just don't know what the next steps are if you would right so i would th thanks tracy for calling that out um i think that makes logical sense now that we are kind of in agreement that we are okay to start using six store now we need to figure out in terms of how do we adopt this across all our projects and how do we simplify the effort and, and uh, figure out if any gaps are indeed present for our adoption, right? Um, here is what we can do. Um, and then feel free to comment or time, time chime in. Maybe we could pick up action items in terms of setting up a, a sample GitHub action workflows. Um, and this would, we'll have to divide this in a way such that let's say if one of the project picks up to do this for their container image uh, generation, maybe other project can pick it up uh, if if their major, uh, whatever they are producing the artifact is it let's for instance, a, a binary, right? So they, they can pick up another action or another action item. Similarly, we need to figure out wherever we are releasing, if they have an implicit way of verification. And, and this will ensure us, or I didn't make us come up with list of places which may not have that option. And then it gives us a picture of how do we provide that verification information for, for other things. And I can think of cargo, uh, uh, package manager for Rust and maybe Maven. I'm not sure if they do have like implicit option to store this metadata. Maybe GitHub container registry does have. Um... Right, um, so any thoughts from others? If, if we were to pick up an action item and then um, each project can do an experiment and see if they face an issue. We'll create a playbook of commands to be run, probably. It's it's pretty easy experimenting with six store itself, but we could also create a playbook and I can share it across. But we need uh, volunteers across projects to check if this works. And how about we list which artifact registries we currently use?
Docker Hub is also one. Um, interesting. Which project continues to use Docker Hub? We still use it in Fabric. Okay. In fact, I thought we hadn't settled on whether we could go to GHCR because of the limitations on the uploads. I would, um, do you mean in what way? Uh, when we talked about this during the project best practices, I thought we didn't conclude we, we th I think we concluded that GHCR was the right direction, but we didn't conclude that um, there might be issues around size of the uploads and the frequency of the uploads. I think we thought we thought that GitHub wasn't enforcing the limits at this time, but we thought that they might in the future. And that was that was what was at least holding me back on the fabric side. Um, if they do, um, we're already set up for billing for this. So I would say go ahead and switch to GHCR. And um, if the bill goes to more than $1,500 a month, then I will say something. But right now, the billing for storage has been on the order of less than a dollar a month. So give it a whirl. Okay, sounds good. We're also using PyPy and NPM, which I assume would fit. Also crates. Yeah, rust crates. Yeah. So I assume this covers the bread that we have. Um, does anybody use and like generate something that gets stored on GitHub directly? Maybe a CLI or something. Or any anybody? Yes, David. Yeah, we do attach uh, binaries, release artifacts to GitHub. And any project? I know um, since I worked on it long ago, uh, sort of project used to have a Debian release. Does any other, pro I, I know Fabric also had like native Ubuntu Debian releases, right? Maybe in initial versions. We are also missing uh, uh, JFrog. I know that Bezu uh, and Fabric, I think, are using JFrog. Okay, um, feel free to add more items to this list, but I think this gives us a good picture if we can experiment across all these. Need volunteers who can try out. So maybe the first action item could be creating a playlist or playbook with list of commands to execute so that um, we know exactly what we are trying to do across all these um, when, when multiple people are experimenting across these repositories. Um, maybe I can take this action item on myself, should be fine. Or if others want to volunteer, please let me know. The, and need volunteers across, across these registries. Any takers?
Or should we start designing? <laughs> So I don't know what you mean exactly by designing. I mean, you know, I believe most projects use, if not all, GitHub Actions now. I mean, basically, you need to change your workflow for the release so that you sign the binaries and, uh, you know, as an extra step. Right. So, um, so I'm not already suggesting that we create a GitHub Action and when we sign, store that information needed for verification in GitHub releases, because since all of us are using GitHub action, no matter which of these registries is used or where it is pushed, we store the verification info on under release. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, as a first step, I think that's pretty much what I would do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a logical next step for us, Art. Yeah, I just agree with Arno. Perfect. Um, so until we do that, I'm I, at least I don't have additional topics to discuss in the task force. Anybody else have any other comments? So I just one thing I, I want to share is you know. There's one thing that's a bit, you know, it depends how you feel about it, but I, I hope, you know, my experience, I was playing, you know, that's a little like over a year ago. So when I first started playing with the, this stuff, you start using cosine and just to, you know, fool around, experiment with it. And <laughs> you may not realize that it actually creates entry in the public transparency log and it's there forever. <laughs> And actually, Cosine will say something about, hey, beware that, you know, we're going to upload some identi identity, you know, information, and there's just no way to delete that. So if you, you know, if you want to look up the Raker uh, public instance, you could find the entries that I registered just playing around. And so I... I and it really doesn't matter. I mean, you know, nobody's going to blame you for it. But I, I, after a while, fooling around with it and doing experiments, I felt self-conscious about it. And I, I created, a, you know, you can run a local Raker instance so that you can redirect the registration to the transparency log. Instead of using the public instance, you use your own. And that way, you know, at the end, you can just delete it and you haven't, you haven't, uh, you know, kind of littered the public registry with all your little experiments. And so Cosigned will let you define, you know, specify it. By default, it goes to the, the public registry, but you can override that with an argument and say, no, connect to that server instead. If in the if you're using GitHub Actions, you're going to have to make sure this is publicly available, which may not be easy, but um, but that's what it would take. So just wanted to share that. Thanks, Anna. I see a comment from Hart on Discord. Um, no, Arno, no, I'm going to have to get this link. There. Arno, we're going to have to go look and see what you did now. Um, but no, I think it's fine to play on it if they, you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's nothing really exciting, I'm afraid. You know, it's like signing artifact one that has a 
echo foo in it or something like that. it's a file with echo foo it's that kind of stuff it's not very exciting but it's there now you can actually you know create you you can use your own uh private uh repo and play with it that's what i did Okay, well, thank you, Arun, uh, for taking us to the task force. Are there any other topics that anybody would like to discuss before we close out the TOC meeting today? No? Okay. Well, I hope everybody has a great week, and we will see you again next week. I think, Bobby, you're up. You said you wanted the October 12th slot. Is that still accurate? Yes, it is. All right. Well, we will um, make sure that we have time for that next week and have a great week, everyone. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.